In this presentation, I'm going to run through topic three, the particle model of matter for AQA physics. The first thing that we look at in this topic is density. And the density of a material is defined by the following equation. So you can see that the density of a material is defined by mass divided by volume. Density has a symbol rho, mass has a symbol m, and volume has a symbol capital V. So density is measured in kilograms per meter cubed, so kg slash m to the three. Mass is measured in kilograms, which is kg, and volume is measured in meters cubed, m to the power of three. This equation is one of those equations you need to learn, and it will not be given to you during the exam. One of the required practicals was about density, and it was to use appropriate apparatus to make and record measurements needed to determine densities of regular and irregular solid objects and liquids. So if you think back to our equation for density, which I've got at the bottom of the page here, that density is mass over volume, if you want to calculate the density of something, you first need to work out the, the object's mass, and then you'll need to work out the object's volume. To measure the mass of an object, you would use a top pan balance. For liquids, remember, if you're using um, the top pan balance to measure the mass of the liquid, you need to measure the mass of the container first, and then you would measure the mass of the container with the liquid inside, and then you'd be able to find the mass of the liquid by taking the mass of the container with the liquid inside and subtracting from that value the mass of the container. And that will just give you the mass of the liquid then. When calculating the volume, or working out the volume, or taking measurements of the volume, it is different depending on, on what you've got as an object. So for regular objects, such as cubes or cuboids, or anything that's got a regular shape and pattern, you'd be able to use an equation. So you'd measure the sides of that object that you can, such as if it was a cube or cuboid, you do base, height and width. You can measure that with a ruler, and you'd find the volume by multiplying all of those together. For a sphere, you could, you, uh, you could measure the diameter of the sphere, using a ruler or vernier calipers. You could even use a micrometer to measure these lengths or widths and distances. And then use the equation for the sphere that V, the volume, is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Remember that r is a radius, so you'd have to divide your diameter by 2. So for any regular shape, you can use one of the equations that you know from maths, and you measure the size of the object, and then you apply the equation to calculate the volume. For irregular objects and liquids, which you can see over here, you wouldn't be able to calculate the volume. So you'd have to work out the volume in a different way. To do that, you place the object in water and measure the volume of water displaced by that object. All objects displace their own volume in water when they're entered to water and fully submerged. So in this case, we'd use a measuring cylinder to collect the water that was displaced and therefore the measuring cylinder would give us the volume. Now that we have volume and mass, we're able to work out density using the equation that density is mass divided by volume. So now moving on to kinetic theory. Kinetic theory makes two assumptions. It assumes that everything is made of particles and that particles are able to move. And that allows us to explain most things that we see in terms of the particle model of matter. So we can start off with things such as solids, they can become liquids and they can eventually become gases. So if we heat the solids up, you can see that the solids have a nice regular structure here. Um, we heat them up and eventually they will melt to form a liquid. If we continue to heat the liquid, then that would evaporate and become a gas. If we start with a gas now and we want to turn it back into a solid, we have to cool it down. And as we cool a gas, it will eventually condense to become a liquid. And then it would freeze or solidify, the liquid would freeze or solidify to become a solid again. There are some substances that don't have a liquid form. And so when you heat a solid, such as carbon dioxide, that doesn't have a liquid form, it will sublimate to become a gas. And again, if you cool carbon dioxide as a gas, it would not go into a liquid, it would go the other way and become a solid again. It's worth pointing out that state changes are physical changes in which mass is always conserved, so you can't lose the particles, and mass of the particles will stay the same, and you would have the same number of particles in the solid that would eventually become a liquid and then the gas, and they would have the same mass. When physical change is reversed, uh, the, ma the material will recover all of its original properties. So these are unlike chemical changes. So with chemical changes, you can't necessarily reverse the change uh, and get the original properties of the material back. Whereas with physical changes, such as state changes, which we've got here, going from solids to liquids to gases, or in the reverse order, you would be able to recover all of the original properties. We can look in uh, solids and liquids and gases in more detail here. So in solids, you'll notice the particles are touching. Okay, 
They have a regular structure, which means they're all in nice, neat rows. Um, and there isn't much space between the particles. That means that solids usually have the highest density of all states of matter. And in a solid, the particles can only vibrate. They can't, they're not free to flow or move around. They can only vibrate where they are, and they're in fi a fixed position. In a liquid, the particles are still touching, uh, but the bonds between them have been weakened, and they're now able to flow around one another. So they can, liquids can flow, so they can take on the shape of the container. This usually means that there is more space between the particles in a liquid, and so therefore liquids are less dense when compared to their solid form. There are a few exceptions to this, obviously. If you continue to heat a liquid to be able to get a gas, you will break all the bonds between the particles. So the gas particles are free to move. Then there's very little force of attraction between the particles, and so they can move around the container and they fill the whole container. And in a gas particle, in a gas form, that's when the particles have the most energy. So you can see as we go from solid to liquid to gas, we increase in particle energy, um, but we decrease in the density of the material, usually. So now I'm going to look at how um, we can lose heat through evaporation. So evaporation, is, remember, is when we go from a liquid to a gas. And what happens in it with evaporation is that these liquid particles will break their bonds and be able to move away from the substance. Now it's only the particles with the most energy, so the hottest particles, that can leave that substance. And because the hottest particles leave the substance, that means that the average um, energy and temperature for the substance decreases. And therefore, when um, particles evaporate, that reduces the temperature of the original substance. Condensation, remember, is the reverse of evaporation. That's when a gas turns into a liquid. The rate of condensation can be increased by increasing the area of the surface or decreasing the temperature of the surface and decreasing the amount of airflow over that surface. So there's three ways there that you can uh, increase the rate of condensation. If you want to increase the rate of evaporation, you would do the opposite of all of those. So you would decrease the area of the surface, you would increase the temperature, um, and you would increase the airflow. We move on to look at internal energy. The internal energy um, is the energy stored inside a system by particles, atoms, and molecules that make up that system. That's the total kinetic and potential energies of all the particles within that system. In terms of internal energy, you also need to know how heating changes the internal energy of a system. So when you heat something, that changes the energy stored in the system by increasing the energy of the particles that make up that system. So there's two ways that can be done. It can either raise the temperature of those particles or it can produce a change in state. Now we're on to specific heat capacity. So if the temperature of the system increases, the increase in temperature depends on the mass of the substance heated and the type of material and the energy input to the system. So those are the things that determine how much the temperature of the system increases by. The specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of substance by one degrees Celsius. The key term in here to help you remember is the word specific. So in physics, specific means per unit mass. So therefore, as I've said before, the heat capacity is the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram, that's per unit mass, of a substance by one degree C. The equation that you're given in the exam is a change in thermal energy equals mass times the heat capacity times temperature change. The change in thermal energy is an energy, so it's got the symbol E. Mass is mass, so it's got the symbol M. Specific heat capacity, we use the symbol C. And for temperature change, we use the symbols delta and theta. So just a reminder of those things. So energy is changing thermal energy. That's measured in joules. Mass is, um, M is mass measured in kilograms, kg. C is specific heat capacity, measured in joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, or J slash kg degrees C. And finally, delta theta is temperature change, and that's measured in degrees Celsius, as shown there. So now moving on to look at specific latent heat. The energy needed for a substance to change state is called latent heat. So when a change of state occurs, the energy supplied changes the energy stored, or internal energy, but not the temperature. So if you want to define specific latent heat, the specific latent heat of a substance is the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of the substance with no temperature change. Now there are two types of specific latent heat, as we can see at the bottom. The specific latent heat of fusion, which is a, ch a state change from solids to liquids, or specific latent heat of vaporization, which is a state change from liquid to vapor. 
could be asked to define either the specific latent heat of fusion or specific latent heat of vaporization in an exam question. To do that, you would just amend the definition that we've got up here for specific latent heat. So if you wanted to change it for the specific latent heat of fusion, you'd say the specific latent heat of fusion is the amount of energy required to change a solid to a liquid for one kilogram of the substance with no change in temperature. Remember the key term here is the specific part and that remember is something per unit mass. Hence why we need to include the one kilogram. If you'd like to calculate the energy change required for a state change, you can use the equation here. So energy for a change in state is mass times absolute latent heat. Okay, so E equals M for mass times by L, capital L, for specific latent heat. This equation is given to you on the equation sheet. The energy required for a change in state is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, and specific latent heat is measured in joules per kilogram. Final reminder that there are two types of latent heat, one of fusion, which is change of state from solids to liquids, and one for vaporization, which is change of state from a liquid to a vapor or a gas. So now we're going to look at cooling curves. Cooling curves and heating curves can be used to represent what happens to a substance as it's heated up from a solid to a liquid to a gas, or in this case for a cooling curve, as it's cooled down from a gas, going into a liquid, and then becoming solid again. In both cases, we, we put temperature, as you can see on the y-axis, and we put time on the x-axis. Now talk through how we get from a, a gas all the way down to a liquid, and then finally a solid. So at time zero, we, we've got a gas at this point here, and what we're going to do is we're going to try and reduce the amount of energy the gas has, and that will lead to its temperature decreasing. You'll be able to calculate the energy required to do that by using a specific heat capacity equation. You cool the gas down until eventually it will condense to become a liquid. At this point here, the gas is turning into a liquid, and we can see there's no temperature change. If you want to do a calculation here, you'd be using the specific latent heat equation, and the amount of energy then will be equal to the mass times the latent heat of vaporization. And at this point, the energy is being used to make in cooling or break in heating bonds between the particles. So there's no temperature change at that point. Once all the substance has turned into a liquid, it will begin to cool again and the temperature will decrease until this point here. At this point, what we're seeing is that the liquid is now freezing to become a solid. And that's where we get a steady line again because there's no temperature change because again the energy being used to make the bonds and in this case it's the specific latent heat of fusion that you need to use so you need to know the latent heat of fusion and multiply that by the mass to find out the energy required to turn that into a solid. Once you've got a solid you can begin to cool that again and that temperature will, will decrease. It's worth pointing out that the um, specific latent heat of vaporization is greater than the specific latent heat of fusion. That's because more energy is required to change something from a liquid to a gas than the energy required to change something from a solid to a liquid. So when you move from a solid to a liquid, your chain, the energy is used to break the bonds between the solid and liquid to the point where the particles can begin to flow, which requires less energy than turning from a liquid to a gas. And the reason for that is when you turn from a liquid to a gas, you need to break the bonds completely so the particles can be completely separated. So this graph is obviously a cooling curve, um, you would also be expected to be able to annotate and label a heating curve, which would work in the opposite direction. We're now going to look at Brownian motion, which was first observed by a British botanist, Robert Brown, when he was studying pollen grains suspended in water. This effect can also be observed back when viewing smoke particles underneath a microscope. And when you look at smoke particles underneath a microscope, you'll notice that they have this erratic motion that is an unpredictable and random. And this unpredictable and random motion of these particles is evidence that they're having collisions with particles that we cannot see. Smoke particles move around, they collide with the gas particles in the air, which are too small to be seen under the microscope, and that causes them to have the random motion. It's through these collisions that we get the random motion occurring. You also need to be aware that as the temperature of gas particles increases, the average kinetic energy of the gas particles also increase. And this means that the particles will move faster and there will be more collisions at a given time and we would observe more erratic motion. If you're studying combined science, now's the part of the video where you can turn this off because we've covered all the content that's on the combined pathway. If you're studying triple science, you may want to continue to listen to the rest of the content that is for the triple only exam. 
So the first part of triple only content is pressuring gases. So you need to be aware that the particles and the gas move quickly in all directions, but they don't get far before they bump or collide into each other, or the walls of their container. The pressure of a gas is caused by the random impacts of gas molecules on surfaces that are in contact with the gas. So you need to remember that the pressure is due to the collisions of gas molecules with the surface. If you were to increase the temperature of a gas in a sealed container, the pressure of the gas would increase. The reasons for this is the molecules move faster because they have more energy, so they hit the surface with more force, and the number of collisions per second of the gas molecules on the surface of a sealed container also increases because they are moving faster. Both of these effects give rise to an increase in pressure. Triple students also need to be aware of the pressure equation, and you should be aware that increasing the volume in which a gas is contained at constant temperature can lead to a decrease in pressure. So obviously if you've got the same temperature and you make the, the container bigger for that gas, so you, you inflate it, then there's going to be less particles in a given area, they're going to be having less collisions, and therefore the pressure will be lower. For a fixed mass of gas held at a constant temperature, you are given the following equation on the physics equation sheet, and that is pressure multiplied by volume is equal to a constant. The symbols for this is lowercase p for pressure, capital V for volume, and constant, we just write as a constant there. Remember that pressure is measured in pascals and the volume is measured in meters cubed. Exam questions around this equation are often easier to answer by using the equation that I've written in for you below, which is that the pressure multiplied the volume in instance number one will also equal the pressure multiplied by the volume in instance two. And that's because both of those things is equal to some constant. So you can equate the two. An exam question will usually ask you if the pressure of the gas is this at this point and the volume is this at this instant, what would happen if you increase the volume to this bit? Can you calculate the pressure? And so by putting the numbers into this equation I've shown you here, you would then be able to solve that question slightly easier. The alternative way of doing that question is that you would use the initial pressure multiplied by the initial volume to find the constant, and then you would use the equation that that constant was equal to the, the pressure you're trying to find out multiply the, by the volume you're given in the question, and therefore you can use that equation then to work it out by doing constant over volume is equal to your new pressure. So we now move on to our final slide in this presentation, which is work done by a gas. Please remember that work done is an alternative name in physics for energy transfer. So work is a transfer of energy by a force, and you should know that from topic one of physics. What we need to be aware of now for the particles section is that doing work on a gas increases the internal energy of the particles of the gas. And that can cause an increase in the temperature of the gas. So an example of this is that when a bicycle pump is used to pump a tyre, work is done on an enclosed gas inside the tyre. And that leads to an increase in the temperature of the gas inside the tyre. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening and I hope you found it useful.